Hi everybody and welcome to the shed where basically we just play around with stuff that I think is, well, interesting. Well, of course, energy production is a huge issue in our times and it's why everybody is so focused on it and why there is such a massive mix of things going in there, right from the weird and wacky and wonderful straight through to solid and reliable. But of course, what we're really interested in is renewable energy. We don't really want to burn the earth just so that we can have our lights on and so renewables are a big part of that mix. And the reason there's a mix, well, there's no one solution for all problems. There are always associated problems with things and trying to overcome the associated problems and trying to answer different setups means there's this mix of things. And a big part of this mix, obviously, is solar. The approach to solar has basically two approaches. One, if you want solar, build a solar farm. Stick it somewhere out of the way, generate a load and ship it into where you're going to use it. Very similar to how we actually produce energy at the moment, if you think about it. The other is we already live in a built environment, an environment where we have massive cities with high concentrations of urban population. So wouldn't it be great if we could integrate the solar into an existing infrastructure so that we're not using more land to put up solar parks. Now, integration itself falls into two uh, camps. There is one camp where basically integration into existing buildings means nothing more than bolting a load of solar panels on your roof. And of course, that's exactly what we do at the moment. Now, that in itself has its own issues because something like 35% of the cost of a solar installation is just that, the installation. Sticking up the framework and bolting it onto your roof costs a fair bit of money. The panels themselves actually represent something like 20% of the cost. So if you can get rid of that installation cost, you can bring down the overall cost of it to a much more reasonable level. And of course, there are other issues with things like sticking it on your roof. What about if you live in a flat and you basically have no roof? And of course, 50%, uh, I think it's more than 50% now, of the world's population lives in cities, in fairly compact, dense urban environments where you have a lot of people to a very small square footage and you can't put enough solar panels on roofs in order to be able to service that. And of course, think about industry. Industry has great roof spares, sure, but they're Power consumption is equally huge. And so there's an issue with putting it in existing infrastructure in both of those terms, which leads us to the other idea of integrating it into um, the existing infrastructure. Of course, initial attempts at this weren't very imaginative. It was do exactly the same thing we've done with residential, grab some silicon solar panels and bolt them onto the side of the building. Thankfully, Loads of people have been a little bit more adventurous than that. For instance, the solar roof tiles are making the whole panel so it becomes your roof and you have a tire solar roof. There is a building in London that has a curved surface. When the sun hits it, it reflects the sunlight down into the street and has been known to burn cars. A lot of power can be generated from a flat, tall surface like a skyscraper. And we get skyscrapers all over the place. Just think of place, about places like Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, New York City. They're absolutely all over. And if we can use that acreage, then we can generate a huge amount. And that's why, all, uh, sorry, why perovskites are so interesting to people because they can be thin film. You can make them with a degree of transmittance, that is, they can still allow some light into the building, but capture some of the light for power generation. It's an alternative to this is light guides. Light guides are a lump of glass or plastic that trap the incoming light. The light comes in, has a surface that reflects it into the body of the light guide, and then it's trapped, it bounces between the two surfaces, and it will be pointed at wherever you want to point it at. So flat panel light guides take the light in, point it to the edge, and at that edge you can put a solar cell. But you can do more with light guides. 
in the light gowns you can add a phosphor so when the certain wavelength of light hits it like uv or infrared it creates a phosphorescence that phosphorescent light then travels to the edge but the normal visible light goes straight through and if you want to improve the collection even more you can change the nature of the phosphors to collect different parts of the light now doing something with light guides and phosphors in what is basically jelly is a hell of a lot easier and cheaper for people to do than creating perovskites. There is another aspect to light guides, of course. They're modular. What that means is, if you get an improvement in one area, you can replace that. So if you get a better solar cell, you can replace a solar cell element of them, and you don't have to replace the entire structure. That's not quite true with um, flat panel installations or perovskite installations. For home methods, you're pretty much restricted to things like uh, reflecting mirrors, maybe a parabolic mirror, maybe a Fresnel lens, something like that where you can focus the sunlight onto your PV panel. And because you're getting more light, you get more output, but they come with their associated problems. Focusing that light obviously increases the heat and so the solar panel gets hot and the production goes down dramatically in heat and they only really work well when they have an expensive tracking system that can track the sun. And it needs to be expensive because adding mirrors adds weight. So there are associated problems with doing things like that but still looking at those methods is an area of intense interest and the University of Rochester are quietly up to something really, really interesting. Instead of using mirrors, they're using what are called light guides. So remember these things, it's a, an LCD screen from a computer. This one's from a Mac, as it happens. We did a video on taking these apart, and I can guarantee for some people at the end of this video, you're gonna be asking yourself where to get these, because in these is a lump of acrylic. Let's take this apart and get that acrylic out. And there it is, a magical lump of acrylic. Now the whole point about this, is to take the light from the LEDs or cold cathode that comes in from the side, spread it and diffuse it. It is a light guide. The surface of that light guide is dimpled, and it's dimpled because it has lots of little inverted pyramids in there. So when the light hits it, it bounces off the side of the pyramid just like a mirror and gets pointed down one side. And of course the other sides are coated with white reflective material, so that bounces around in the plastic and you only get one exit which is a strip along the bottom. Now, it doesn't really matter whether the light comes in from the side and is bounced out through an LCD screen or whether you put the light through the LCD screen and bounce it out the side, you still get the same kinds of efficiencies with this. And the structure is essentially the same. So there's a huge technology behind that to support the manufacture of those things from three millimeters thick up to a centimeter thick. And you can get hold of those things relatively easily to have a go yourself. Okay, so to demonstrate this, I've got my light guide set up the same way that it was in the computer. So all the light comes out of here. Remember, that's where the cold cathode went. So the light came in. Now it comes out of here. And I've got this little solar cell that I put tape on with just the same width as this here. I've connected it to this motor, which is basically acting like a resistor, and we're reading the current. Now, if you see where I hold it there, we've got about... So if I hold it there at the right level, we've got about seven or eight microamps. If I slide it over to the guide, then you'll see that jumps up to about 18 microamps back there. It'll drop right back down to about five microamps. So that light guide gathers all the light around, bends it and projects it out where the solar cell is. What are the advantages of such a system? Well, it is stupidly very much cheaper, despite the fact that you could use pretty expensive solar cells along the edge there. Because it's lighter than the tracking systems required are also very much cheaper. Now the University of Rochester say that in their experiments what they're getting is a 50% uh, 50 improvement for area covered and a concurrent reduction in the cost. Other benefits include it doesn't heat your solar cell, not nearly as much as focused PV does. And they're calling it concentrated PV or CPV. So if you're using a lens or a mirror, you're using focused PV, which is FPV. If you're using a light guide along the way that Rochester's doing, you're using CPV. Now CPV is of huge interest. Rochester is using 
the kind of light guides that we dug out from that LCD screen, probably for exactly the same reasons that we did. They're just there and they're easy to use and practice with and see what you can do with them. But there are other companies working on circular light guides that trap the light, direct it to the centre and then put that light onto a single solar cell in the centre and they're reporting similar kinds of efficiencies. And light guides can be found in places like our LCD screens, but you can also find them in things like this. This is a Garriston 30 watt lighting panel that have become extremely popular in offices and there's no surprise why. I mean it's really thin, really light and this particular one I think costs about £10 or something. So really stupidly cheap. And what you'll find in here is exactly the same kind of thing that you find in an LCD screen. Now the technology in here is basically light emitting diodes along the edges, along through the light channel, bend it up, diffuse it and spread it all over the place. <laughs> Sometimes a bit like owning a skunk, doesn't it? Anyway, that's how they work. They work the same way, incidentally, in LED computer screens. That's a bit of a, a, a chiz, really, because I always thought it meant it had lots of little LEDs all over the computer screen. It doesn't. What it means is that instead of having a cold cathode tube at the back to shine the light, it uses bright white LEDs. So LED TVs and lighting panels have exactly the same technology for distributing the light. The difference being, of course, a lighting panel's a tenner and an LED TV will set you back hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. Anyway, let's take this apart and have a look at the inside of it. Okay, so about a million screws, undo them and lift off the metal back and you'll see the kind of things you expect. Right there is a piece of foam to protect everything and these are the wires going to the LEDs. Then we have a super bright white reflective piece of plastic that obviously reflects the light back out again. And this is what we're looking for, this piece of acrylic here. This is your light guide, which is right there. And it's a light guide and diffuser. So that actually is the light guide bit right there. And then this bit is the diffuser. So it's the bit that makes it sort of um, pretty and even all over the place. And here we have the lights themselves. So just a strip of LEDs right there and right there at the bottom and these just join those LEDs up. The thing about LEDs is they work both ways. You put electricity in there, you get light out. You put light in there, you get electricity out. Now this thing here is running on the ambient. It's got about a millivolt or so and if I shine a torch on it, there we go, jumps up to a couple of millivolts or so. So we've got here the potential of a homemade solar panel from an old light fitting. Now all we're really going to do is put the stuff back. We just want it to hit the light guide and shine that light into the LEDs. Look at there it is set up and it's actually producing about 3.7 volts. I'll give you a close up of the meter and just to see if we can see it. Okay, I'm not actually too sure how you, well you can see this but there's a little fan going there. There we go, and it is producing 49 milliamps. <laughs> so about 3.6, 3.7 volts and 50 milliamps. I mean, okay, it's not a lot, but it's certainly better than the poke up the bum with the sharp daffodil when you think about what it is they actually did with this thing. I mean, it's this original thing. We've got the LEDs in there that are really meant for lighting and all we did was remove the frosted panel and suddenly we've got ourselves a solar generator, a solar panel. I thought that was really awesome actually. Um, of course we could improve that. I mean if we put actual solar cells in those strips instead of the LEDs we get a much better result. Remember gallium arsenide solar cells are reportedly 40-45% efficient. If we did something like that then certainly we'd be able to get a good result out of that. And the benefits of this? Well it improves the efficiency by about 50% and so we only need to put in less in the terms of solar cells and so if we put more expensive solar cells in there that have a higher efficiency of course the overall thing is going to be very much cheaper and that's the point we can generate the same electricity very much cheaper from a couple of lumps of plastic but of course light comes in a huge broad spectrum the solar cell can only work on quite a narrow bit of it, surprisingly enough. You do get something called multi-junction solar cells that will 
adapt to a broader spectrum, but they tend to be a bit more expensive, in fact, quite a lot more expensive. So, what can you do about this? I mean, wouldn't it be great if there was a wonderful material that took the light we couldn't see, and here I'm talking about infrared or ultraviolet, and somehow transferred it into light we could see, and then directed that onto the solar cell, we should get an improvement. We should be able to supercharge our solar cells with all that light we couldn't be uh, uh, couldn't use before. Now, because the reason I'm talking about this is because that is exactly what folks have been up to. If you think about this idea of fluorescence, a material will fluoresce by taking a a spectrum of light that you can't see, taking that energy and transferring it into a spectrum you can see, which is the fluorescence that you see. So these materials already exist. They already exist as dyes. We've all got glow-in-the-dark stuff and fluorescent fingernail paint and the new acrylic paints that are coming out of fluorescent coatings. They're just awesome. So this material already exists. So if you've seen our video 1647, then we used this, which is a light guide from the back of an LCD, to bend the light coming in and point it at a solar cell to get an improvement from a solar cell. And I got this Wix solar cell. Now I want a kind of better reading than that, so I'm going to cover most of the solar cell up with some cards, so that all we're really reading is one segment of it. So if I cover that up, then we get a segment there. And if we have a look at that output with the torch shining on it, we'll shine the torch on so the torch doesn't move, so the light doesn't move, we can see that we're getting 0 0.868869867, something like that of a volt. If I take my light guide and pop it on there, then we can put that voltage up. Not the most brilliant increase in this condition, but we're still getting an increase. Now, what I've got here is a safety shirt. This particular safety shirt's got two elements. It's got these reflective strips on it, but the yellow here is actually a fluorescent dye. It's been dyed with a yellow fluorescent dye. And if we put that together, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Okay, 100%, that was a bit rough and ready. I mean, we, we hang a shirt on an old cell CD. Well, we took it from 0.8 of a volt to 1.3 volts, and that was really dramatic if you think about it. And I mean, I was only really testing the idea of whether this fluorescence would work like the research papers say it would, and yeah, it seems to work. Now, in my mind, if something works when it's rough and ready, it's going to work better when it's well made. If something doesn't work when it's well made, you haven't got a hope in hell. So the next thing, obviously, is to make a better version, because there are a lot of questions I have, and so I'm sure a lot of questions you guys have, but I wanted to show you that this idea of putting a fluorescent dye on the back of a light guide is going to dramatically improve the solar. And we supercharged the solar using, well, a t-shirt, but it was soaked in fluorescent ink. Went so well, I thought I'd give it a go, making a fluorescent um, body gel and see if we could replicate that, but with this gel. So, first things, I've grabbed myself a highlighter. Highlighters are a fluorescent ink and they're water soluble, which is really cool. So, take your highlighter, crack it open, and inside you'll find the ink. Now, it's actually cellulose acetate surrounded with a plastic. That cellulose acetate, incidentally, is the same thing you find in cigarette filters. 100 millimeter, uh, millilitres of deionized water. Stick your felt in that and the ink will come out into the water. There you go, almost immediately. We give that a little bit to soak and we'll get ourselves a fluorescent dye. Okay, so I repeated that, 200 millilitres of water, give it a squeeze. <laughs> there we go, that's our dye out of there. Now we want to turn that into a jelly and to do that we need one teaspoon of gelatin because we've got 200 millilitres of our dyed water in there. So a, a teaspoon of gelatin, pour some of this in here and leave it to soak. 
So once it's swollen up a bit, well, we can make a jelly. So you just make this just like you make a jelly. Heat it up, let the whole gelatin dissolve, pour it into a mould and leave it to set. And here's my mould. It's just a plastic tray that I've oiled. And here it is set. Let's get it out. Okay, here's my black box. We'll cover it over with a bit of paper and take our, <laughs> our jelly. Pop it on there. There we go. Now when we turn on the UV light, this should fluoresce. <laughs> Isn't that cool? This has no light guide properties at all. So what I've done is I've cut it into a triangle and put a bit of reflective paper behind it. And here's my solar cell and we pop it on there. And there we go. <laughs> That's very cool. So there is our fluorescent jelly made out of one of these. And we saw it fluoresce and we put a structure on a solar cell and got an improvement in the solar cell. Now that obviously from the pound shop, four of them's a pound. I went to the trouble of buying these. These are fluorescent acrylic sheets. That is like a torch is turned on, but they are ten pounds each. So it's a bit more expensive, whereas that's a bit cheaper. And certainly it's something that could be played around with. For example, pour it on a Fresnel lens. That might have a really interesting result, actually. Um, definitely one to try. Should anybody try it, let me know, because I'd be absolutely fascinated. Okay, so here's our ground, here's our solar panel, and morning, afternoon, evening. Now, in the afternoon, the sun's rays come straight down, hit that panel, and are at their peak efficiency. In the morning, they come that direction, and basically you get zip. There's a huge energy reduction. The output of the panel drops through the boots when the rays hit it that way. Okay, that's a problem. Main thing people do is tilt the panel, and then follow the sun with the tilted panel and that's what solar tracking is all about. But, as we were doing this fluorescent stuff it occurred to me, what about if you put just a prism on there? If we put a prism on there then these rays coming in will be reflected straight down. Equally, if they're coming in from there they're going to reflect straight down and if they're coming straight from above in the noon then no issues at all. So what about sticking a few prisms across the surface of your panel you'd get an improvement wouldn't you so to my mind that's sort of like a tracking system isn't it i mean it's like a tracking system without any mechanical components all you got to do is stick a load of prisms on there and hey presto you can get those rays from the sun and of course there's bound to be something wrong with that because who wouldn't have thought of something as simple as that and there is something wrong with it turns out that if you stick anything on top of a solar cell, including a lump of glass, it'll absorb some of the light. And when it absorbs some of the light, of course, the electricity generation goes down. And the difference in cost is so much that it doesn't really make it worthwhile. However, while we were working on this fluorescence idea, I noticed something. What I noticed was this stuff fluoresces. I mean, wow, hey, genius or what? But I also noticed something else. When you put it on top of some uh, solar cell, that fluorescence offset the amount of light that was being absorbed by the jelly. Now you can check whether I'm talking BS or not really easily. Two main ways. One, go to the pound store and buy yourself a highlighter and some jello and knock yourself out giving the quick test to see if I'm talking BS. The other is jump onto Google Scholar and have a look at the research where you'll find lots of people have been trying fluorescence and getting some great results. But, the idea, let's make some triangles out of a fluorescent material, stick them on top of a solar cell, and see if that solar tracking will work. Because certainly, we get a much improved input when the light comes in and we have a triangle on top. What shape does that lump of material have to be? I mean, we tried a 90 degree triangle, eh? And it worked pretty well, but the sun's moving. And it may well be that's not the best shape. I don't know, maybe a sawtooth, maybe a triangle, maybe a prism like that, maybe a rounded prism. No idea. But that's the thing to be investigating, to see if we can actually get that to happen. So how would it work in solar tracking is my plan, because I think that that, well, that could be enormous. I mean, obviously, 
we wouldn't put jello on top of it. I mean, we've got things like, you know, drying out rot, insects, all that sort of stuff. But experimenting with this kind of stuff can end up costing you thousands of dollars. So finding a medium where you can experiment with it, and yet it's only going to cost you pence and mostly the effort, I think is huge, actually. And of course, jello with um, highlighter pen in it isn't the best material. There are better materials out there that we, uh, we could be looking at. But we don't need to look at those first. We can do all of that experimentation using jello and highlighters to find out if we're talking BS or not. And that's what I was thinking about. That's my plan for world domination. Of course, the fatal flaw in that plan is I've just shared it with everybody. But I'm OK with that. I think things like this should be public domain. I think the things that we should be working on. And that's the direction I was thinking of. If that works, of course, we've done something worthwhile. So hopefully it excites you guys as much as it's excited me and hopefully a few of you guys will pitch in there and give this one a go and see if we can actually work it out. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.